Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see everybody here. This is actually our regular, I'll do a little ad. This is our regular time for our Institute for Human Genetics seminar series, and it's, it's good to see some unfamiliar faces. And you're welcome anytime, uh, Monday afternoons at 4, and we alternate between here and Mission Bay campus. And I believe uh, even today, Mission Bay campus is, is watching the proceedings here today. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce um, today's seminar. Uh, actually, um, this seminar features the UCSF Presidential Chair, and it's part of a week-long series of uh, lectures and seminars that are co-sponsored by the CT2G. And I, should, I should have started by thanking, before I forget, Barbara Koenig for organizing this event or, and doing a lot more organizational than that. And I, and I also want to thank the Institute for Human Genetics staff who also provide a lot of support and help. I, in particular, Lynn Duncan, I think, uh, gave a lot of help. So C22G, I think Barbara refers to this as sort of a tongue twister. It's the Center for Transdisciplinary LC Research in Translational Genomics. All right. <laughs> and that's with no sleep. <laughs> right. So what is C22G? So I just want you to know there is a website. Okay, and uh, the the C22G actually is um, it it's actually uh, derived from an NIH grant. It's a P20 planning grant for an LC Center of Excellence, and it's a collaboration between Barbara Koenig here um, in the School of Nursing, the Institute for Health and Aging, um, and colleagues at Kaiser Permanente who are also here: Carol Slomkin and Julie Harris. Who I, there she is. So. Um, Anyway, this is a great new uh, center that we have that's going to be focusing on um, looking at ethical issues um, and social issues in the translation of genomic medicine into clinic and public health practice. And the series um, that is going on this week actually also very much reflects um, a major mission um, at UCSF right now, which is in precision medicine. Um, which actually is, a, is it's an initiative that links together many strengths at UCSF, not just in basic sciences, but also in clinical and health policy. And uh, we have representatives from health policy here as well. So this is, this is a topic, obviously, that's of broad interest and brings together, as I said, many different disciplines. We'd also want to acknowledge um, the Office of the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, who, that enabled um, the UCSF presidential chair and, and allowed us to bring to campus a distinguished scholar um, uh, in this area. And fortunately for us, she's going to be here for a while yet. So hopefully many of you will have an opportunity to interact with her, and it's, uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it and be thrilled like I am. Now it's my pleasure to hand the baton off to my genomics medicine initiative leader colleague, Bob Nussbaum, who will introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Neil. Well, this is really a tremendous pleasure and an honor. Uh, Wiley Burke is a national leader in medical genetics. Uh, she received her uh, BA degree from Brooklyn College, after which she went out to Seattle, where she received her MD and her PhD from the University of Washington, and did her internal medicine training and her medical genetics training, and has been at University of Washington uh, on the faculty um, ever since. She is a practicing geneticist whose research sits at the interface between the clinic and society. Her expertise encompasses many important areas, including ethical considerations and public policy implications of genomic technology, particularly how to make wise use of the technology through careful ethical deliberations and public engagement. She's also written widely on genomics in primary care, genomics education, involving patients in research design and consent, return of genetic test results in both research and clinical settings. There are very few physician scientists I know whose teaching is as thoughtful, deliberate, and influential as is Dr. Burke's, as evidenced by her, her service on many national panels for the NIH, the IOM, many other governmental and nonprofit organizations, including her service on the board and as president of the American Society of Human Genetics. In the phrase made very famous by the old E.F. Hutton commercial, when Wiley Burke talks, people listen. <laughs> we are very fortunate to have her visiting as the presidential chair. Dr. Muin Curry is a highly interdisciplinary thinker. 
He received his BS in biology and chemistry from the American University of Beirut, as, as was his medical degree, after which he moved to Johns Hopkins, where he got his PhD in epidemiology. He did a residency in pediatrics. Afterwards, he uh, completed a uh, medical genetics uh, residency back at, at that time called the Fellowship back at Hopkins, and has been at the CDC pretty much ever since. He is a card-carrying epidemiology researcher and a clinical geneticist, and since obtaining his genetics training at Hopkins and in the mid-80s, he's been at the CDC in one capacity or another, but always at the intersection between genetics and public health. First, his research on cancer genetics and birth defect epidemiology is well regarded and respected. However, Dr. Curry's accomplishments go beyond the epidemiology of diseases. As director of the Office of Public Health Genomics for the past 17 years, uh, an office whose name I think you probably invented, yeah, he has brought the principles of public health and the rigor of epidemiology to bear on assessing how genomics is or should be used in clinical practice, and in doing so, has helped shape how we all think about and frame the issues. Just one example. The ACE model project, referring to analytical validity, clinical validity, clinical utility, and ethical, legal, and social issues, which came out of the CDC's Office of Public Health Genomics, has been very influential as the first publicly available analytical process for evaluating scientific data on emerging genetic tests. He served on the board of directors of the American Society of Human Genetics, as well as on two highly influential Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Advisory Committees on genetic testing and on genetics, health, and society. We're very lucky to have him participating in this presidential chair lecture series. To sum up, both Dr. Burke and Dr. Curry are very influential leaders, not because they tell us what to think about genomics, public health, and society, but because they continue to teach us how to best think about these issues. And we're very lucky to have them. Finally. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and it is a pleasure to talk with you today. Uh, I want to talk about the process of genomic translation, uh, the hopes that are attached to it, and some of the questions that arise when we think about truly delivering benefit through genomic translation. So let me just start with how we see genomic translation currently being uh, formulated. It's very straightforward. Uh, it starts with knowledge about associations between genes and disease. Uh, a burgeoning technology allows us to look at this in a very sophisticated way and to use that knowledge to develop a variety of products, basically diagnostic tests, knowledge uh, about disease biology that's informed by an understanding of genetic contributors, and then new treatments. And the ultimate goal is improved health outcome. It's a very exciting moment in genomic research because we're already beginning to see returns on this, uh, on this framework. And we see it uh, informing really the work of the National Institutes of Health. Um, so we see Francis Collins talking about re-engineering translational science, using molecular tools uh, to, uh, to basically inform innovative ways to develop therapeutic products. Uh, he's talking in this particular paper about the, the new National Center for Translational Science uh, that is at the NIH. Uh, and he's talking about the variety of ways in which molecular tools now enable NIH to expedite and improve the process of drug development. And that is a very exciting thing for medicine. Um, and we have some interesting examples. Genomics offers us the story of Gleevec or imatinib, uh, which utilized foundational uh, genetic observations. Uh, to understand an opportunity to develop an innovative therapy, Gleevec. Uh, and uh, this was a very exciting moment when old research about chromosomal changes in a certain form of leukemia ultimately informed a new type of therapy that proved effective in treatment of that leukemia. Um, it also identified a series of kinase pathways which represented uh, important therapeutic opportunities, and we now have many, many new drugs. 
uh, utilizing these insights and developing uh, new therapeutics for cancer uh, based on kinase pathways and, and increasingly other pathways as well. So there is reason to be optimistic about this, uh, this pathway to improved medical care but also reasons to be cautious. Um, so amongst other things, in this array of new drugs, uh, we have seen some amazing home runs, uh, but we've also seen drugs that offer incremental benefits at very, very high cost. Here's a study um, on the cost effectiveness of cetuximab, who's, which is one of these um, innovative drugs uh, now used, now having indications for treatment of late stage colorectal cancer. And as you can see, what this drug does is offer rather small added life expectancy at very high cost, costs that are above what we would normally consider from a policy uh, perspective uh, acceptable uh, in, in terms of cost effectiveness. So lots of promise, um, but also lots of potential to uh, contribute to some of the problems that our healthcare system is dealing with. Uh, problems of limited therapeutics, uh, lim therapeutics with limited cost effectiveness and very high cost. And if we step back and look at this kind of opportunity uh, from a public health perspective, uh, Glasgow and colleagues have articulated this very well. Uh, they've said as we look at new technology and we look at these exciting opportunities, um, we have to ask some key questions. The cost effectiveness question is obviously front and center. Um, and it's related to, to the two other questions that come next. Um, is it accessible to all who can benefit? A drug that costs humongous amounts of money and offers very little benefit is not going to be accessible to everyone. And in fact, it's not even delivering that big a benefit. Um, will it exacerbate health disparities? Of course it will. Those kinds of products will. So we have to look very carefully and I think very critically at what the new technology will uh, will offer us. Um, Glasgow also offers another critical question, which is we always have to step back and ask who's profiting and to what extent are we committing ourselves to a use of a translational pathway that really has a fairly narrow uh, um, opportunity for profit, um, a generating of a, a medicalized healthcare system with more sort of marginal therapeutics that um, offer industrial uh, industry benefits but don't necessarily benefit the population as a whole very much. Genomic medicine uh, raises some similar kinds of questions. So genomic medicine has been defined uh, by a group that came together and and uh, uh, deliberated about this as using an individual patient's genotype information in his or her health care, his or her clinical care. In other words, uh, genomic medicine is, is currently being construed and proposed as a way in which we will use genetic information about an individual's risk in order to drive their health care. And there's a huge amount of excitement about this opportunity because of uh, a, a rapid technologic development that now gives us increasing opportunities to identify uh, with more and more precision uh, an individual's uh, genetic propensities. Uh, and so we have to really think about where is this a good thing, where is this maybe not such a good thing. <coughs> And we've had some dramatic uh, progress in the past 20 years. I'm giving you um, a set of pedigrees here uh, showing different families where breast cancer or breast and ovarian cancer has uh, been present. Uh, <clears throat> and the ability to identify genetic risk has been very helpful for families, particularly families on the far uh, right hand of the picture where we see a high rate of breast cancer uh, breast cancer occurring at very young ages, ovarian cancer also present in the family. Uh, many of these families have mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, 
we can identify affected family members, we can offer them preventive interventions, we can direct the therapy uh, more successfully when they get cancer, and there's now actually some trials of drugs that may be particularly useful for cancer occurring in women uh, with BRCA1 mutation. So, uh, so there's been a lot of benefit um, to that small proportion of the population that carry this genetic predisposition. Uh, we're now seeing the uh, study of breast cancer genetics expand and increasingly identify other genetic susceptibilities that may possibly help us also to direct preventive care. So this kind of thing is very exciting, uh, and, uh, and, and we can see ways in which it may empower both uh, prevention and treatment. But we also have to be mindful of the limitations. So as part of the excitement about this technological opportunity, we're beginning to hear about the possibility of whole genomes that is looking at the whole genomic comp complement of an individual, now technically possible and on the cusp of being economically doable. Um, for everyone. Uh, and we're not talking about um, focusing on identifying rare, uh, what we would call highly penetrant uh, genetic conditions, that is rare instances in which identifying a genetic risk, identify someone who's have, who is at very high risk of disease and might benefit from uh, rather specific tailored therapy, but rather the idea that we might use this mass of genomic information about individuals in order to, in a much more general way, empower prevention. Um, as Dr. Collins describing this opportunity says, um, it would allow an individual to focus uh, on the things that they need to pay more attention to and perhaps less on other things. So there's this idea that we might be able to use the genome to sort of profile one's future health risks uh, and, and that would lead to better prevention. Well, I'm not sure this is such a good thing. So there's a problem with genetic risk information used in this way. First of all, it's not particularly motivating. We now know that from a small number of studies, and it's not surprising because risk information isn't all that motivating in general. Um, if you do whole genomes with the intent of finding people who have higher risk of heart disease, breast cancer, diabetes, whatever you might um, want to find, you will also find people at reduced risk, so it's not really clear how that works on a population health level. Uh, and then, if you think about what we really want people to do um, to be healthy, uh, most of the time what we want them to do is think carefully about their lifestyles and we want, them to, we want to help them uh, to benefit their lifestyles. And it turns out altering the environment around them uh, proves to be a more effective way than doing that, than, than uh, doing genetic risk assessments. So, so we have to think about putting genomics in context here as we think about um, population health, as we think broadly about benefit. Um, and broadly about what we might like the National Institute, Institutes of Health uh, to do when it's thinking about translational research. Now, here's another uh, uh, view of this problem from an entirely different perspective. So this is the health impact uh, pyramid from Dr. Frieden, the director of the CDC. Um, and uh, he's quite clear, I think, that whole genomes are not the way to motivate people. As you can see, at the top of the pyramid, where you have the least uh, population impact on health, uh, is counseling and education and even clinical interventions. Um, he notes that uh, these really aren't the key to better population health. Broad population-based interventions like clean water, clean air, et cetera, are always going to have a uh, bigger impact. But also, he's extremely interested in the idea of making the right thing easy to do. So at the base are socioeconomic factors, but a lot of his attention comes just <coughs> above the base uh, in changing context to make uh, default decisions healthier. So instead of telling someone uh, that they're at higher risk for diabetes or heart disease, make it easier for them not to drink those high sugar drinks or not to smoke or not to be around people who smoke. 
In fact, um, he recently uh, made some public statements um, that really push against the genomics agenda. Your longevity and health are more determined by your zip code than they are by your genetic code. He was speaking about recent data um, that shows that there are, is a, a, across the U.S. in different geographic locations, there's a twofold difference uh, in life expectancy, uh, and it can be attributed predominantly to differences in rates of smoking, uh, rates of obesity, rates of exercise, diet, drug and alcohol use, and, and access to medication. Um, and what he's saying is we have the biggest impact when we work on this default choice, and that's what we need to do. So he's voting for a vision of pop population health that really doesn't include genomics at all. Uh, and that's an interesting uh, prospect to think about from, th from the perspective of genomic translation and asking ourselves, how do we achieve benefit from uh, genomic translation? Now, it, it's certainly intuitively the case um, that eating right and exercising well uh, and all those things that we all know we should be doing um, are easier to do if you're in a social environment where others are doing it. And in general, our lifestyles are strongly affected by our social environment. So we can certainly agree with Dr. Frieden that uh, making environments uh, more conducive to healthy lifestyle is a good thing to do. Uh, and, and a lot of creative people are actually thinking about how to do that, including the folks that tell you exactly how many calories you're buying when you go to the cafeteria here. Um, so, uh, so there are um, interesting opportunities. But the, uh, the disease burdens that we're concerned about, those significant disease burdens of our society, which include heart disease, diabetes, uh, cancer. Um, they are all diseases where genomics plays a role. Genomics is an important contributor to those diseases. So how do we think about, on the one hand, the very important insights from public health that tell us we need to really think about people's context and environment? Um, and at the same time, think about where, where does genomics fit in? Is genomics really something that should be focusing on drugs, and particularly drugs for very sick people or people with rare diseases? Or where might it fit in with population health? So let me just talk about diabetes for a moment. Here are some statistics from uh, 2010. Uh, and it tells us that diabetes, which has uh, been rising uh, rapidly over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we're seeing increasing prevalences of diabetes, is also a disease that is disproportionately associated with uh, social disadvantage. Uh, and we really have to think about that uh, in terms of the social context issues even though we know that genetics plays a very significant role, even though that we know that there are now numerous genes and numerous gene variants that influence the likelihood that a given individual uh, will be diabetic. Um, now, another uh, piece of epidemiologic data shows us also that the burden of diabetes is strikingly different across different racial and ethnic groups, and that has um, uh, that has caused some to raise the possibility that what we see is a different degree of genetic burden uh, across different groups uh, in terms of susceptibility to diabetes. I, I'll just take a stake here and say that I think that's an interesting idea, uh, and we certainly do see genetic variation across different groups according to geographic ancestry. Um, but I think it's important that the groups that are experiencing the highest burden are also the groups that suffer uh, the greatest social disadvantage. Uh, and in fact, um, so far as we understand the genetic contributors to diabetes, all groups seem to carry uh, quite a significant um, uh, propensity. So bottom line, uh, if you look carefully, lifestyle can account for most of type 2 or adult onset diabetes risk. Uh, this is just data, representative data from the Nurses' Health Study in which researchers found that 91 percent of cases could be attributed to factors associated with lifestyle. 
even though genetics clearly also plays a role too, what we begin to see is a picture uh, of the fact that within any population, there are going to be some individuals who are more susceptible uh, than others, uh, but that the environment around them is likely to pl play a critical ro role in uh, determining whether or not the, suscept the susceptibility makes itself known. In fact, diabetes fits very well into uh, what is now called the ecological model of health proposed by the Institute of Medicine um, and, and reflecting uh, uh, many years of research around social context and its contribution to health. Uh, and as you can see, they position the uh, innate traits of an individual and disease biology at the center and note that around that are behavioral aspects, uh, social family and community aspects, living and working conditions, and then broader social and environmental, uh, uh, cultural and other uh, conditions that determine whether or not disease will be present. Um, in a very important theoretical uh, argument uh, 20 years ago, uh, Lincoln Fellon uh, argued uh, about this notion of social conditions as fundamental causes of disease. I think this is really important for genomicists to think about because we kind of think genome is fundamental cause of disease, is the fundamental cause of disease. And what Lincoln Fellon argue um, is that social conditions will give us an understanding of the conditions that put people, as they put it, at risk of risks, um, influencing multiple different risk factors and multiple different diseases in such a way that an association is maintained between the social conditions and disease outcomes even when the intervening mechanisms change. Uh, a striking example they used to support their argument is that social disadvantage was 100, 150 years ago a very powerful risk factor for infectious diseases of a variety of sorts. People at social disadvantage were much more likely to be afflicted by a range of infectious diseases. Um, a, a century later, um, with our understanding of hygiene, our access to antibiotics, our access to immunization, that's no longer the case. Um, but what we now see is that social disadvantage exposes people to a higher risk of obesity, a higher risk of uh, sedentary lifestyle, a higher risk of poor diet, and therefore the risk for the predominant disease burdens that we are concerned about. This is both, I think, a moral imperative that translational research think about this, but also a, a, a really important opportunity and clue, if you will, particularly if we understand that the diseases we're most interested in are complex diseases with a very complex set of etiologic factors that certainly include genomics. I want to talk about another sort of broad area, um, just as another example, and that's the broad area of cancer inequities. Again, we see among bo both among racial minorities and among, amongst low-income groups uh, an array of inequities related to cancer. We see higher rates of late-stage diagnosis, higher incidence of some cancers. Uh, Prop, uh, poorer treatment outcomes, higher mortality, uh, and the truth is we don't have to look hard for reasons. We've got lots of reasons uh, for this. Um, we have uh, a variety of difficulties uh, around accessing high quality medical care. Um, we have people who are dealing with significant competing priorities that sometimes make it difficult to attend to health issues or give them the kind of priority that might help them to achieve better outcomes. And we have individuals living in social environments that either increase risk directly through, for example, environmental exposures or make risk reduction harder, uh, harder to find healthy foods, harder to to uh, take a walk uh, in a neighborhood that may not be safe or in a neighborhood so far from your work that you're in a long, long bus ride uh, to and from work, et cetera. Where does genomics come in? 
Um, so let me talk about this very interesting example of triple negative breast cancer and what we've learned about it from breast cancer epidemiology in West Virginia. West Virginia is a very impoverished state. It actually has a relatively low incidence of breast cancer, about 46, and one of the highest rates of breast cancer mortality uh, in the nation. It's, uh, as people have tried to dissect what is going on in the profile of breast cancer in West Virginia, um, what they've noticed is a uh, disproportionate percentage of young women with triple negative breast cancer, a breast cancer that has a particularly poor outcome. This is a very interesting entity. Uh, it, it, it's probably a heterogeneous group of breast cancers, and indeed molecular analysis is, is slowly trying to uh, determine what those different subtypes are uh, and investigate therapeutic opportunities. It's also the breast cancer that's most common amongst women with BRCA1 mutations. So a clue that genetics uh, may play a very significant role. And uh, it's also disproportionately more common in African American and Latina women. Epidemiology from the state of California tells us that. So what's going on here? What, what is this, uh, what can we learn if we try and investigate um, this, uh, this unusual breast cancer profile? Well, epidemiologists who have been exploring this in uh, West Virginia are, are focusing on uh, associations of this particular cancer uh, phenotype with, with obesity. Uh, and it could in, indeed be a, uh, an issue of poverty, uh, making people at risk of risk, and that this may have something to do with these cancer outcomes. Um, but clearly also, we have to think about biological mechanisms and what these kinds of observations might be telling us. There are fortunately uh, a tremendous number of hypotheses now about the embodiment of social advantage. Um, and uh, very exciting work across a broad range of uh, biological sciences gathering data to investigate these hypotheses and to uh, increasingly find uh, interesting data to support some of these suppositions. So we know that there are a number of components of social disadvantage that are associated with poorer outcomes, including poorer cancer outcomes. And these include nutritional deficits, particularly early in life, uh, lack of nurturing, lack of a safe environment, stresses such as are provided by racism. Uh, and the hypotheses speak to stress-related changes uh, in a variety of bodily functions that may uh, directly or indirectly relate to cancer risk. Uh, and there also are uh, an increasing uh, number of studies that point to epigenetic changes. In fact, uh, one investigation of triple negative uh, breast cancer found evidence for methylation patterns that uh, resulted in turning off of the BRCA1 gene. So people that didn't have BRCA1 mutations, but as a result of epigenetic changes, were in fact not expressing BRCA1, um, and thus having a vulnerability presumably very similar to that of a woman with a BRCA1 mutation. But why would that be happening with social disadvantage? Um, I, I would propose that these kinds of questions really are front and center, or should be front and center, uh, in the genomic translational agenda. So the question we might ask is, what counts as genomic medicine? What we've been told so far is that genomic medicine is doing your whole genome, predicting your risk, and using that to guide your prevention and, and ideally to empower your prevention. Um, we've also been told that it's pharmacogenetics and it's drug development for increasingly targeted drug therapies. I would propose that genomic medicine is also understanding the embodiment of disadvantage, using molecular tools to understand in particular cancer, which we can argue is a disease of the genome, uh, trying to understand how that confluence of social factors results in increased risk. What's actually happening at a molecular level, and what kinds of insights does that give us uh, about appropriate uh, interventions, which 
which may be very far from drug treatments. Uh, they may, in fact, be knowledge that empowers and supports social programs, early childhood nutrition or prenatal care, perhaps. Um, and uh, the argument I want to make is that if genomic translation is to support population health, this ought to be uh, within, within the purview. Um, Dr. Hyatt here at the UCSF with his colleague uh, Nancy Breen from UCI, uh, NCI uh, has given us a, a model for thinking about the kind of research we need to bring to bear, um, a, a framework for thinking about research occurring at multiple levels and in, the research at different levels informing each other, taking into account social determinants, healthcare systems and how they influence health outcomes, uh, behavioral and psychological parameters and biological, and in his framework across, uh, across the trajectory uh, from prevention opportunities, pre-cancer to the development of cancer and, and on through the process. And so the question I would argue for genomic uh, translation is um, where does genomics fit in? How does genomics fit into this model? Huge opportunities. Um, as I say, uh, cancer is fundamentally a process in which the genome of the cancer tissue is changing. And that change uh, is driving um, this process that we call cancer. Now, of course, it's not occurring in a vacuum. It's occurring in a host. And so increasingly, we have an understanding of cancer as tissues that have evaded normal growth controls um, operating within a system that somehow isn't containing them. Uh, genomics clearly has much to offer, not just genomics in terms of inherited uh, change, but also genomics in terms of acquired change and all of the molecular tools that go along with that. Epigenomics clearly is going to be a very important player. Um, we need to understand more about all of the different ways in which RNAs interact in systems biology. The microbiome, uh, every reason to think the microbiome plays a role in colon cancer uh, uh, outcomes, for example, uh, and, and that's just a beginning. Again, we're at a wonderful, exciting time in genomics where the tools are proliferating, the potential for knowledge is, is proliferating, and what I think this framework tells us is it is really important to think about ways of using this knowledge within context to help us address the really serious population health problems that we face. And again, as Hyde and Breen have said, the opportunity here is for transdisciplinary research. Um, the idea that unexpected and novel insights can occur if you've truly integrated a team, a team across different, um, uh, different disciplines, different training, different backgrounds, different languages often. So there's an issue of learning to speak uh, to each other. Um, and as they put it, hold their own knowledge lightly to seek new perspectives from the interaction with others. So what does this mean for genomics? I want to propose that the uh, current vision of genomic translation is fundamentally as simplistic as this picture. It's very genetically determinist. It's like taking the bars and the stripes and getting plaid. It's, it, although there is acknowledgment of the environment, although there is acknowledgment of interactions with the genome in disease causation, the genome is at the center. Uh, and, and it's often not just at the center in terms of highly penetrant genes, but in terms of gene-gene interactions. Um, I want to propose that what genomics needs to do is step back from the starring role uh, and become a member of the ensemble, uh, the team, uh, listening to others, talking to others, and figuring out how to talk to each other uh, in order to deploy these amazing genomics tools uh, in a broader way. Uh, addressing broader questions where other etiologic factors are equally important. 
And what will be necessary to do this is uh, negotiating what some experts have called the irritative phase. So the idea here is that you have independent research. That's a lot of what's going on here. Different people are doing their thing in their laboratory using the technologies that they're familiar with. You then have multidisciplinary assessment, and that's clearly going on with all the common uh, complex diseases that plague our society. Different disciplines are looking at the problem in different ways, and sometimes uh, people are reading each other's disciplinary publications. Um, and then you get to the irritative phase. Um, and the irritative phase is where you need to have debate and deliberation, and that debate and deliberation has to question each other's assumptions, question each other's methods, question how they apply to the problem. It's uncomfortable. Uh, it, 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 it sometimes uh, results in people um, criticizing each other's approaches sometimes rightfully, sometimes not so rightfully. Um, but arguably, that is the only method um, by which you get to truly trans tan transdisciplinary research. Um, and I think it's time for genomics to enter the irritative stage. Uh, uh, and what's the payoff? Uh, the payoff is developing um, an approach to genomic translation that truly focuses on population health, um, that, that um, uses the model of translation that I'm showing here as a cycle, uh, a cycle that goes from discovery to development to delivery to outcome, the, the usual phases of translation, but has at the middle an assessment and priority setting stage um, where there is true deliberation across different perspectives, across different disciplines, even across university and community, um, to figure out which research questions um, are worth developing, which ones really matter, um, and how do we bring the perspectives of different um, uh, different areas of expertise to bear. Um, clearly, if we're successful, we'll do interesting and innovative work, um, and then we'll have. Uh, what I would say is a problem, but a welcome problem, which is how can we make sure that we, that everyone who could benefit from new developments truly has access, and then the uh, ongoing responsibility of seeing how things worked out and feeding that back into the next cycle of translation. And I, I'm proposing that that's, that's the direction genomic translation should go. Thank you very much. I'd like to just explore with you and elaborate on, on uh, Wiley's points about the population versus personalized approach to improving health. Uh, and tell you a little bit about uh, how that interface works. Already she's demonstrated how it might work. I'd like to expand a bit on the concepts of gene environment interactions and how uh, potentially we could use some of the tools and then end up with a translation framework beyond bench to bedside. So we live in a, in a sort of this uh, era where we we all make the case, uh, and um, Eric Topol has uh, made that case, and uh, uh, he uh, says, let's get over it. Nobody is the same, and the one size fits all doesn't work anymore. We need to tailor our interventions to individuals based on genomics and other big data. On the other hand, you have this. And you know, we both looked at the same MMWR article and it was a last addition to my set of slides, I'm sure, with Wiley, because it just happened. And you know, when um, you, know, you have this sort of uh, uh, apparent conflict, which I think is no conflict at all, because both our zip code and the genetic codes are important to our health. And we don't really, I mean, there are different contexts for uh, what you use and when to use it. Yes, of course, access and geography and reduction of risk factors. And we know diabetes is mostly environmental, but it's mostly genetics. I mean, if you think about uh, your strongest uh, risk factor for diabetes, that, that's your family history, along with your other modifiable risk factors. So how can we use uh, these tools uh, together? So another representation of this uh, apparent paradox has been uh, this nice paper by Jonathan Fielding from down south and uh, the LA County Health Department and uh, uh, actually Steve Toich who uh, works with him about sort of how we can improve health, the intervention level 
from the individual all the way to the society. And as we go from uh, birth to death or from being well to, to dying, and there is primary care all the way to tertiary care, and there are all these things we can do to improve health. And yes, we do spend most of our time not in the clinic, I hope. I mean, we spend all our time so we can improve our health outside the clinic, not necessarily interacting with the healthcare provider. So this is their example of how that um, approach can be applied to type 2 diabetes as an example. Uh, and you know, you can do all these things from behavioral interventions to menu labeling and affordable produce and screening at the right time, but you need the evidence behind any and all of these things so that we can actually integrate them into the uh, holistic approach to uh, type 2 diabetes uh, reduction. This is again um, uh, my boss's uh, uh, pyramid again, and this has been a guiding principle at CDC. And you know, wonder why I'm doing. I mean, why am I here? Since this is sort of the uh, the mission of CDC. Yes, I'm at the top of the pyramid with less and less health impact, but. Uh, you know, there is more genomics that meets the eye. And if we start thinking about a holistic approach uh, to how we can use the new genetic information to change the context, provide uh, uh, all kinds of things that could help. I mean, uh, Wiley talked about the uh, uh, sort of uh, stress and the environmental uh, social determinants of health. I believe there are tools that can help us there. At the end of the day, what is public health? I mean, what is public health? It's all we do to improve health from a population perspective. And there are really three functions. Uh, I submit to you any new technology uh, will have to abide by these principles. We need to assess what they can do for us, develop the right policies, and then assure the, the right services to the right people. So one example, I mean, of this assessment function, and basically this is what Tom Frieden said, that this is the most important thing public health can do. It provide uh, increase the degree with which decisions are made, made basing good data. And good data is epidemiologic, it's uh, social, behavioral, all the, the tools of uh, population sciences. And we've used those tools at CDC. And by the way, uh, for those of you who will attend uh, my talk tomorrow, I will go over a few examples of what CDC has done in public health genomics over the last 15 years. But today I'll just focus on on Wiley's talk. So we, uh, this is data from NHANES, which is a population-based survey, and we've done a lot to feel the pulse of uh, the genetic pulse, so to speak, and how, uh, uh, because NHANES collects a lot of information on behavioral and, and outcomes. Assurance functions, I, I don't have to tell you. It's very important that uh, even the best research will not save lives if it's not used. And that applies to genomics, too, whatever technology we can develop. So we need to invest in, in developing uh, programs and evaluating them. And this is when Tom Frieden said that in a conference last year. And there is a movement on genomics and health disparities. Uh, there have been a couple of conferences I've been part of. Uh, there is upcoming one in Washington earlier this year. It's called Why We Can't Wait. Um, so the second point I'd like to make is that this holistic approach to genomics uh, resides in the concept or expanded concept of gene-environment interaction, because all disease is 100 percent genetic and 100 percent environmental. No matter what heritability analysts will tell you, it's 50 percent this, 50 percent that. That's a uh, mathematical analysis. But in, in point of fact, uh, there is genetic and environmental factors for everything. And when I went to school many years ago, and maybe this is the practice of medical genetics, we think about single Mendelian genetic diseases, thousands of them, and maybe thousands are being discovered because of whole genome sequencing. But then there is a complex disease, which is 95% of human disease. Uh, maybe the sim simple genetic disease model can apply, like PKU, but even there, there is a lot of environmental interactions, like in the case of PKU, your diet. So our idea of complexity is evolving rapidly. It really, epigenetics, as Wiley mentioned, is opening the door. It's not anymore your DNA variation. It's what happens to the expression of that DNA over time, over generations uh, in utero, and this early determinants of health, and whether genes are turned on and off, and who you inherit your genes from. Uh, it's a movement that cannot be stopped. I think we're beginning to evaluate those tools, I and mean, we're still in that early phases. And then, what genome are we looking at? I mean, while you mentioned the cancer genome, but we live in a symbiotic in, uh, relationship with, uh, 
with our microbiome in our uh, gut, and there is more of them than there is of us in terms of the genes, many more of them. And uh, the, uh, all of these tools, I mean, we're just beginning to sort of uh, scratch the surface of what we can do with these tools. All kinds of claims are being made uh, at the end of the day. But uh, CDC is, uh, is interestingly right now investing a lot in what I call uh, personalized microbial epidemiology, which is the use of advanced molecular tools, pathogen genomics, to actually track uh, outbreaks and, and uh, look at the sources of antibiotic resistance. And th these are a few examples that have been published the last couple of years. Pathogen genomics is alive and well. And these are tools that could provide, they're not just your genome, the, the genome of the bacteria. And we can use them to track epidemics and, 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 and so on and so forth. I already mentioned the microbiome, but the microbiome, these are just a couple of recent studies. This interaction between our diet and our genes and the genes of uh, the commensals that live upon us is a, is a strong uh, uh, hypothesis. I mean, it has a lot to do with, could be with, with a wide variety of adult chronic diseases like asthma and obesity and so on, but we need the data. We need the research. We need to establish those connections in order to uh, look at the interventions. The last but not least, another way that genetics has been used to uh, infer uh, environmental uh, causation is the concept of Mendelian randomization. I don't have time to explain, explain all of this, but this is uh, recent data from that looked at, uh, uses genetics not in the context of gene disease associations, but in the context of gene uh, associated with modifiable risk factors. Uh, because these things like body mass index or your folate level, uh, there is a lot of confounding goes on. But because of the Mendelian experiment, uh, people are using genes as an instrument variable to infer indirect causation. And therefore, you don't have to act at the level of the gene. You, you, ha you can still act at the level of the environmental or uh, intermediate factor. This is another way we can use the tools of genomics, not just measuring your own genes to uh, tell you what your risk is, but to do something about your environment. We've already heard from Wiley about the multi-level analysis that needs to be done. This is a sort of a, the representation of what happens with the obesity as uh, your molecular genes and your uh, at the sub-molecular level at the patient population level. And we need all these tools and, uh, in order to make progress in the field. I'd like to end up with uh, uh, my concept of translation because I've been written, writing about this a lot. And uh, uh, sort of uh, reiterate what Wiley said, because she referred to Terry Manolio's paper in which uh, the definition, the new definition of genomic medicine, which is this definition, bench to bedside, which is diagnostic and therapeutics. And I think it's a great definition, but it, it's also only a part of, uh, of what we need to look at. So even there, uh, you know, I mean, if you, if you take away the word uh, um, sort of diagnostics or bedside and use the word application. What is, you know, from the discovery of the genome to the application, we need to explore all types of applications beyond diagnostic and therapeutics. Some of them may not be at the bedside. Some of them may be in the field, like with the molecular epidemiology of, of drugs. We need to also keep in mind and understand the drivers of population health. We've heard the social determinants of health. We cannot use genomics in abstention. It has to be part of the, that team effort that Wiley mentioned. We need to have the, the, the knowledge, the policies, and the resources to act. And we need to integrate research and practice in a cycle of healthcare learning and health learning. And there is a lot of that going on right now with, uh, with the uh, PCORI. Uh, this is a new institute that does uh, patient-centered outcome research institute. They have a network of um, uh, healthcare learning that looks at outcomes. This is my expanded concepts of genomics translation. We, we, we need to do much more than the initial discovery. The initial discovery can be done using basic clinical and population sciences, but we need to evaluate it so that we can develop the, the right evidence-based guidelines and policies and do implementation science to integrate it into healthcare uh, and prevention programs and look at outcomes at the population level. It's a T1 to T4, obviously driven by knowledge synthesis, integration, and policies. This is another. Uh, approach uh, than what Wiley presented at the end. Unfortunately for us, and I've been tracking this field now for many years, the last paper we published uh, a couple of months ago, there is very little going on beyond initial discoveries and published genomic research. Very little 
um, evaluation so that we can use it, very little implementation science, and very little outcome research. This is a huge area of where uh, potential for research, balancing a research portfolio from discovery all the way uh, to having a health impact. So in summary, the three points I'd like to uh, sort of um, uh, leave you with, which is the same um, points that I think maybe with uh, a little bit of uh, em different emphasis, is that in order to make uh, an impact at the population level on health, we need both population and personalized approaches. No one uh, approach will fit the bill. And it's time to stop putting a competition between the two approaches. I think we can use whatever tools that can take us there, basically. And the new genomic-based technologies will provide or could provide opportunities to improve health beyond our traditional genetic testing uh, drug development paradigm, but we need data to evaluate them. And then the multiple scientific disciplines will be needed to, to make that translation happen to improve both individual and population health. So with that, I'd like to leave you. Thank you very much. Thanks. I want to thank our two speakers very much. I'm Barbara Koenig from CT2G. Please do check the website and come to any of the continuing discussions that we'll be having uh, throughout this week and as we try and build some of these ideas into our research agenda here at UCSF and figure out how we can collaborate across the different parts of the campus. So thank you all for coming today.